Hi. Welcome to reInvent. Welcome to our session. This session is how to migrate your SQL Server workload to Amazon RDS. And my name is Eugene Stepanov. I'm a principal database solution architect with AWS. And before we begin, I would like to thank every single one of you for giving, me, giving us this opportunity to be part of your event. It's a pleasure and a privilege. Today, I'm joined by Greg Darby and, um, from Deadless Group. And uh, Greg's organization just went through a large-scale migration over to Amazon RDS. And at the end of the session, he will take us through his journey and he will share um, his experience that they've learned during this process. And with that, let's take a look at our agenda for today. First, we will take a look at Amazon Relational Database Service or Amazon RDS. Now, RDS is fully managed platform to run your relational database workload. But the question becomes, why do we care? Well, we care because RDS provides managed experience. Some of these things that our system administrators and database administrators spend countless hours on here come to you as the managed experience and you might wanna, and you might wanna leverage them. Then we will take a look at some of these building blocks, building blocks that RDS is built from. And then um, I will take you through a couple of use cases, couple of scenarios that I see in the field people, our customers use to migrate their SQL workloads over to RDS. And last but not least, we will take a look at how monitoring is done on RDS. Very, very, very important subject. Uh, with that, let's take a look. Amazon RDS. Now, RDS has been built with a single mission in mind, and that is to free you up, you, our customers, from uh, tasks and responsibilities that our database administrators spent a lot of time on on a daily basis. Um, procuring hardware, installing servers, installing operating systems, and SQL Server. Uh, that list goes on and on and on. Um, well, you might say, well, our organization's been doing it for a while. We got pretty good at it. What's the problem here? Well, the thing is, unless you're in the business of running infrastructure for your customers, none of these things differentiate your business from your competition. And RDS provides a great opportunity to leverage these managed experience so you can redeploy those very valuable IT resources to the projects that deliver value to your customers and differentiate your business from that of your competition. Now, RDS supports uh, most popular commercial database engines, SQL Server and Oracle. It also supports uh, most popular open source engine, Postgres, MySQL, and MariaDB. Uh, and the last but not least, it, will, it supports uh, engine of our own, Amazon Aurora. Now, there is a little bit of confusion. Um, as people, I see that quite often, people think that Amazon Aurora is, is, is sort of uh, an engine of its own. Um, it, it's, still, it's still under overarching RDS umbrella. Uh, we, you, we rely on the same control plane, and um, that just happens to be our engine, and that uh, comes in two flavors. It comes in Postgres compatibility as well as MySQL compatibility. Uh, and with that, let's take a look at... Um, at some of that managed experience that, that, that I was talking about. First comes to mind is managing backups, right? And again, um, uh, managing backups probably most critical and most important part of, uh, 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 of responsibilities of the database administrators. 
Now, um, we've been doing it for, for a while and, and we got good at it, right? We, maybe we do something like full backup on the weekend and then maybe differential backup uh, every midnight and then maybe a T-log backup every 15 or maybe 30 minutes. Here on RDS, this whole thing comes to you as the managed experience, which means it's literally a checkbox and the dropdown on the console. You click that checkbox and you pick any number of days, uh, anywhere from zero to 35, 35 being the maximum, and we will maintain the entire unbroken chain for that many days. So you can uh, have that point in time restore capability. Now, uh, opening up a hood a little bit, we implemented it uh, differently from the way you would implement it on-prem. Um, on-prem, you, you would probably do, uh, 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 again, relying on the native backups. Here on RDS, we take a full EBS block level snapshot. It's a storage level snapshot once a day, every day. And then we take um, T-log backups every five minutes. Um, now, uh, 35 days is the maximum retention, um, uh, retention you, can, you can select. Now, um, storage level, block level snapshots are different from the native backup, backups in, in, in many regards, the, the, but there's one specific one I want to mention here because I think that's this is very important to remember and that is um, uh, performance impact. You see when you initiate a full backup on your SQL Server instance it's the compute resources of your database instance that will be used to produce the backup. Now when you initiate an EBS snapshot it's the compute resources of underlying EBS volume, uh, I'm sorry, uh, of the underlying EBS service that will be used to produce the backup. So from the performance impact standpoint, EBS snapshots are a whole lot lighter weight than the full backups. Very, very important to remember. And um, we rely on VSS or Windows Volume Shadow Copy to do that. We quiesce the I.O. using VSS, and then we uh, trigger the EBS snapshot. Now, uh, every, time you, every time we talk about non-native backup, this question of application consistency versus crash consistency keeps coming up uh, again and again. Now, and without going into too much details, about the difference between the crash consistency and the application consistency. And it's a, it, and it's a quite complex topic, uh, by the way. It, it is sufficient to say that crash consistency is the consistency from, this, from the file system standpoint, right? What you want is the consistency from the SQL server standpoint, and that's application consistency. So our snapshots are all application consistent. And the last uh, line item I want to sort of touch on, this is the newer, newer feature, and it is only available on our R5D family. And if you choose R5D uh, to, uh, to, uh, to deploy your database workload to, um, we will place the TEMDB on uh, locally attached instance store. Now, and by doing so, we essentially separating the highly volatile transient data from what you care about, right? And the, the actual LDF and MDF files sitting on EBS um, and uh, the, the tempdb just not gonna, not gonna pollute your, um, your um, uh, your EBS snapshot, and 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 that's and that's what you want. Very important to remember. Uh, moving on, on top of automated backup, there is another feature which is similar to that of automated backup, 
but now uh, manual snapshot um, it, again, very similar to automated backup uh, in a way it's been implemented, but now uh, it manual snapshot, uh, uh, you, the customer, manage the entire life cycle of manual snapshots, meaning you trigger it on your own schedule and then you can keep it as long as you need. You, you, you can keep it indefinitely if you want to, which is going to charge you for the storage. And um, it is also VS, it is also VSS enabled, and also just like the manual snapshot, it is application consistent. Very, very important to remember. Now, um, now let's talk about native backup, right? Native backup have been such an important part of uh, SQL Server ecosystem that uh, our platform would be wouldn't be well received if, if, if we wouldn't support this feature. And um, we do support native backup and there's a diagram on the right here. Um, it, it works slightly different from, from the way you, um, you, you work with this feature on-prem uh, because here in RDS you don't no longer have access to the file system. And since you don't no longer have access to the file system, we make it work through S3 service. So uh, let's say you want to bring your backup to RDS, you would upload your backup full differential or log or maybe a combination to S3 bucket and then you would initiate a restore command and, and that's the, you see the signature on the right. Um, you initiate that command and we would restore uh, your instance for you. Now it also works in another direction where let's say you want to you want to do a full backup of your running instance you initiate the the full backup or different differential backup and we would produce the backup and we would store it in your S3 bucket from that point it's it's a native backup it's sitting in your S3 folder you can take it and you can do whatever you want with it. You can bring it on-prem or you can take it to, to another cloud provider if you want to. Now, um, uh, not too long ago, we implemented multi-file backup uh, restore. So this is a great, great um, performance optimization feature. Please use it. it, it the the backup is going to go a whole lot faster if you do, if you do multiple files. Uh, very, very important to remember. Uh, that brings us to the next feature, which is our high availability implementation. And this is probably the most important feature of our, uh, of our managed platform. And um, those of you who implemented high availability before you probably have done something like failover cluster instances or possibly always on availability group groups. And, um, and you know how involved that process is, how many moving parts are to it. There is to it, right? Designing it, implementing it, and after that the, the fun begins where now you need to monitor it and, and maintain it. Here, it all comes to you as the managed experience. And, and again, it's the checkbox experience. You click a checkbox on the console, you tell us that I would like you to maintain a second synchronous copy in the second region. And we would deploy, under the hood, we would deploy um, uh, uh, that synchronous replica in the second availability zone. And we would monitor and maintain the replication between the two. Now, under the hood, the way we implemented it, we rely on two different mechanisms. One is database mirroring, and another one is always on availability group. So for the newer versions, uh, for standard and enterprise, we rely on, uh, always, on always on availability group. And for some of these older uh, versions, um, we rely on database mirroring. 
Now, in order for this to work, uh, backup retention has to be greater than zero. It, you have to be in full recovery mode. I, I hope that makes sense. And as I mentioned before, it's going to be a synchronous. It's going to be a synchronous replica, and you cannot change this. It, it's, it's synchronous only. Now, both automatic and manual failovers available. Um, what we're going to provide you, we're going to expose you a listener endpoint where your application connects to. And just like with traditional always on availability group, God forbid something happens, we're going to fail over to a hot standby. And then uh, essentially all your application has to do is to have, uh, is, it has to have retry logic to retry, reestablish the connection and re-execute re -execute your SQL, right? Now, from the failover time perspective, I've seen it being as low as five, six seconds. Now, it's important to note here that in order for it to be that low, you have to be connected to the listener endpoint and you have to use relatively modern driver on the client side, on the application side, that can support multi-subnet failover equals true setting. Um, very, very important. If you enable that feature, then essentially you short-circuiting the whole DNS propagation uh, because now your client is aware of both IPs um, that's, that's, that's behind the listener endpoint. Very, very important to remember. Now, um, one more thing on this, and, and that creates the confusion. Uh, there is no ability to send your read traffic over to hot standby. Uh, that hot standby, and I'm repeating myself here, that hot standby is reserved for high availability purposes only. Now, if you would like to uh, scale out your reads, then there is another feature, and that's a, that's a read replica, and that's my last point in this list here. You have an ability to um, to create up to five in region read replicas, and um, and again, it's all managed experience. It's just a few clicks on the console, or maybe a few lines of uh, 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 CLI or SDK code, and you can easily create these replicas. These replicas are promotable and they are asynchronous in this case, right? If the hot standby is synchronous replica, then the read replicas all asynchronous. And again, you cannot change that. All right, uh, next one. Uh, Cross-region automated backups. This is a newer feature and um, we had multi-AZ, we had read replicas for a long time, but uh, what our customers wanted to do, they wanted to extend it to another regions, right? And we take our customers' feedback very, very seriously. Uh, in fact, 90% of our roadmap is driven by feedback like that. And uh, uh, not too long ago, we launched cross-region automated backup. And again, it's a, it's a part of our managed promise. Um, you have an ability now to enable and select uh, a second region of your choice. And if you do that, then we will start streaming the EBS snapshots um, as well as T-log backups over to a second region. This is a great, very, very inexpensive uh, feature because now you can have the, the snapshot and the T-log sitting in the second region, but uh, you don't have to pay for the, for the compute node for, for the live SQL Server instance. Very, very inexpensive feature. And here, we've done some tests here. You, you see the numbers on the screen. Um, we, we were testing 1.2 terabyte database. We run the test a few times. And we saw that the, at the minimum, the second region was, um, in terms of latest restorable time, was um, six minutes behind the source. And the, the worst case uh, we saw, it was 17 minutes behind, behind the source. Uh, 
again, latest restorable time. And uh, at the bottom here, you have uh, 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 rough, rough ideas. You can get rough ideas for the RPO or recovery point objective and the recovery time objective for, for all these features. I'm, I'm not going to read it, but pl please take a look. All right. Uh, the next one, integrated Windows authentication. Very, very important feature. And I talk about this feature with my customers pretty much on a daily basis. And scenario goes something like this. Hey, um, we've been running SQL Server workload on-prem for a long time. We, we, we have a large footprint on-prem and we're trying to get into the cloud, but it's not gonna happen overnight. So for the time being, we would like to run our uh, database workload on RDS, but we would still, we would like to leverage our identity store and permission store as is um, on-prem. And um, this scenario, it, it, that's a supported use case. It, it's been supported for, for a long time. Now, it requires one additional step though. It requires you to launch AWS Managed AD, that red triangle on the, on, on the diagram. And after you launch that Managed AD under the directory service, you can now join your RDS instance to that domain. And after that, you can uh, establish one-way trust between this uh, Managed AD and your corporate AD uh, that, that's sitting on-prem. Now, you can establish two-way trust. That would be your choice. We're not requiring this. In order for this to work, it would have to be one-way trust, in which case the uh, managed AD becomes trust in uh, uh, directory and, um, and your corporate uh, domain becomes trusted. So those tickets fly one way. Now, um, there's a little bit of a confusion here. Um, and that is uh, Kerberos versus NTLM, right? Um, just to remind you that integrated Windows authentication can use two different protocols. One is Kerberos and another one is NTLM. Now, Kerberos is, from the security standpoint, is much stronger, is much stronger protocol, and, um, and it's a de facto standard, right? And that, this is what you want. Now, the thing to remember here is that when you join RDS instance to AWS Managed AD, we're going to create a service principal name or SPN for fully qualified domain name only, right? So if you wanna if you wanna use Kerberos, and, and, and this should be a, 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 a protocol of choice. Um, important to remember, you have to connect to your instance using FQDN. If you connect to any, uh, to any other endpoint, like a DNS endpoint, then uh, Kerberos is not going to work. It, it's going to default to NTLM authentication. Really, really important to remember. And that brings us to feature supported list. Now, I put some features here. Um, uh, I, I didn't try to list every single feature that we support uh, on the slide. That's not the point. The, the, what we support and we, what we not, don't support, very well documented in the user guide. The, the point of the slide is to convey that unless you're using some more exotic SQL Server features, uh, maybe something like uh, well, polybase, for example. It, it, and I'm not and I'm not saying it in the negative sense. I, I think polybase is, is fantastic feature. Um, but um, unless you use in some of these features, the chances are that um, you will have no friction um, bringing your workload to RDS because. Uh, essentially, we support a very large portion of the entire 
uh, SQL Server ecosystem on RDS now. And that brings us to second part of this talk. And now let's take a look at some of these building blocks that are used um, by the RDS platform. And first of all, of course, it's the, it's the compute instances, our compute instances again. Now, um, every time I do this talk, I have to update the slide because something has changed. Uh, I used to be able to fit everything on one slide. Now it's now, now I can only uh, fit in, in two slides. It's this slide and the, and the following slide. And again, it's a busy slide and, and I'm not trying to list every single instance and every single t-shirt size here. It, it is not the point. The point is to convey that we have a, a wide variety of instance types and the, 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 the chances are, whatever your workload might be, the chances are that we will be able to find a good instance type that would be a good fit for your workload, right? And um, I'll start with our flagship instances, our R5 family. Now, um, when you select your compute instance, the first thing that comes to mind is vCPU to memory ratio, right? And, um, and I'll use the smallest one, the X large, as the reference point. And in R5 family, X large comes with four vCPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. And this ratio will not change whether you look at the traditional R5 or maybe um, some of these newer types like R5D and R5B, that ratio will become, uh, will stay constant. Now, um, recently, not too long ago, we added R5D and um, uh, what differentiate these instances is the fact that now we, ha we have a, a locally attached ephemeral store, instance store, and um, we, use, we use that for TempDB for all kinds of obvious reasons. And um, the next one in R5 family is R5B. Uh, what differentiates these instance, instance uh, types is the fact that now these are uh, EBS optimized and essentially give you the 3x at the instance level. They give you the 3x uh, IOPS and throughput comparing to the traditional R5 instances. Now, we also have Z1D family in, in the me under memory optimized umbrella. And the, uh, as far as memory to vCPU ratio, that's the same. Uh, X large comes with four vCPUs and 32 gigs of RAM. Uh, but now we used very fast Intel chips. These are four gigahertz Intel chips. So if your workload can leverage and can take advantage of something like this, then maybe, maybe Z1D is, is, is uh, instance type you want to take a look at. Now, if four VCPUs to, four VCPUs to 32 gigs of RAM is not enough for your workload, then you might want to look at X1 and X1E family. Um, in this family, the same X large uh, size, T-shirt size, comes with four vCPUs and 122 gigs of RAM. Now, that's the, the from, from the ratio perspective, this is, this is very dense, very dense um, instance, instance class, class. And uh, in terms of uh, uh, general purpose and burstable instances, uh, we do have uh, general purpose. If you don't need buffer, your buffer pool to be that large, maybe you can um, uh, leverage uh, uh, general purpose where uh, uh, X large comes with four vCPUs and 16 gigs of RAM. And for the very small workloads, small or burstable workloads, or, or maybe even development 
boxes um, you could use something like T, T2 and T3 these are very very inexpensive um, instance types all right the next topic I want to touch on is our elastic block store or Amazon EBS and uh, storage subsystem is a big part of what we do as the database administrators right and uh, uh, here on RDS we rely on EBS but then the question becomes okay what is EBS EBS is essentially a solid state device that's been attached to your compute instance over the network and uh, after that uh, compute instance sees a block device it formats it it puts NTFS on it and from that point on it, it's no different from from any other storage subsystems it, it's just now a file system right now EBS comes in two flavors in two storage classes the GP2 or a general purpose and the um, and IO1 or provision IOPS we call it now there are some numbers here please take a look at them I'm, I'm not going to talk through through all of them I'm just going to point out some of the uh, uh, most important differences the first difference that comes to mind is maximum number of IOPS per volume in general purpose class you can only scale single volume to 16,000 IOPS as opposed to 64,000 IOPS on uh, on IO1 volumes the second uh, uh, very important difference is the maximum throughput you're gonna get per volume and now we're talking about 250 versus 1000 very very important important difference uh, IOPS to GB ratio is, is obviously different. In GP2, you get uh, three IOPS per every gig you provision. And that ratio can go up to 50 to 1 uh, for, the, for the IO1s. Now, the next one is also a very important difference, and, and not too many people aware of this because it's essentially deep in, in our documentation. And uh, important to remember that general purpose storage class been designed to deliver the actual performance 99% of the time, as opposed to 99.9% .9 of the time for the, for the IO2 volumes. So it's the variance of actual delivered uh, performance that is that is much tighter on on the provision IOPS, which can be a really important for production database, especially database workloads, right? And the last one I want to mention here is the fact that um, performance on GP2 scales with the volume size it is impossible to scale performance independently from the size again you get three IOPS for every gig provisioned um, uh, in GP2 on IO1 uh, you can scale it independently within the 50 to 1 ratio really really important to remember and that brings us to our next topic which is migration and uh, where we can talk about some of these scenarios that and some of these use cases and, to, and methodologies that people use for uh, migrations now native backup is the simplest of all right and and, and I would say probably 60 and to maybe 70 percent of, of our customers rely on native backup to bring their workloads uh, on uh, to RDS and it, th this is very simple right you take full differential log backup you upload all of that to S3 bucket you can even automate this process and then you initiate the restore command and we're going to restore instance for you obviously great feature very very simple uh, but now um, 
you're gonna have to take downtime, right? And the amount of downtime um, you're gonna need, obviously, equal to amount of time it takes to take the backup, upload the backup to S3, and then restore that backup from the S3. Now, if uh, if that's not something you will be willing to tolerate, um, then maybe AWS Database Migration Service or, or DMS um, can be a, a, a second option to look at. Now, DMS is nothing but a replication engine, which can do both bulk load, initial bulk load, as well as ongoing changes. And the way it does the ongoing changes, it essentially reads all the changes from the transaction log, bring those physical changes to the replication instance, does the logical decoding of those physical changes, essentially turning them into a SQL statement, and then applying those SQL statements against the target endpoint. Now, um, DMS has been around for a long time. Um, our customers have been using it with great success for a long time. Now, heter uh, uh, DMS has been built with primarily with heterogeneous migrations in mind, where you're going from one engine to another, but nothing, nothing uh, uh, will stop us from using this for just for SQL Server migrations, right? This this is this is very much supported supported case. Um, and DMS supports wide variety of sources. Again, um, it, it is very well documented. And by the way, we just launched another source and um, and that is Azure SQL Managed Instance. Uh, but be very careful, that source supported only since that build number. Uh, build number 3.4.6. Now, one of the limitations we see in the in the field um, uh, that um, that database migration service has pretty limited support for DDL. Now, if your schema is in flux, uh, then then maybe DMS is 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 not uh, is not the best choice. And that brings us to our, our next um, option, which is transactional replication, right? And transactional replication is a native feature. We've used it for a very long time. It's been battle tested, it's bulletproof. Um, and um, not too many customers aware uh, transactional replication is supported on RDS. And um, it is very well documented. We have three blog posts um, uh, about, and these are step-by-step -step instructions how essentially to set this up. Um, if if that's something you wanna you wanna uh, 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 try out, um, and that brings us to post-migration steps. Now, after every migration, well, I, I have some post-migration steps here, and um, uh, most of these steps are uh, not really RDS specific, um, maybe with the exception of the last one, um, where we encourage you to enable uh, CloudWatch and Performance Insights and, and Enhanced Monitoring, because these are the native um, RDS features. And that brings us to the last topic I want to cover during my presentation, and that is monitoring on RDS. Now, um, let's maybe start from the top and go clockwise. A, 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 well, you've done SQL Server workloads, you've ran SQL Server workloads for a long time, and you probably rely on SQL native features like DMFs and, and, and DMVs, right? And um, we're not taking it away from you. 
here on RDS, um, a lot of your scripts that you've developed um, on-prem will work just fine. The thing to remember here is that if a particular function uh, requires SA access, it will not work because on RDS, you will not have SA access, right? But the good part that it, a lot of these DMFs and DMVs sit at the database level, not at the master, not at the instance level, and therefore not, not require SA access. So they would just work uh, just fine. Now, the second great feature of, of RDS is a tool called Performance Insights. Now, if you've been doing SQL Server monitoring for a long time, the chances are that you probably used a third-party tool, maybe something like Sentry One or Redgate. There's there's a, 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 a whole bunch of very good tools um, for SQL Server monitoring. Now, what sets um, Performance Insights apart? is that the fact that we were able to boil down performance to a single metric called average active sessions. And now we give you ability to slice that metric by weights, by SQL, by hosts, or by users. A very, very cool feature. And probably the best part is that if you, if seven days is, seven days of telemetry is all you need, this tool comes essentially at no charge, free of charge to you. Really, really great tool and our support um, uses that tool extensively to, 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 to monitor our fleet. And um, the next point is CloudWatch metrics. Now, out of the box, RDS provides a little over a dozen different metrics. And important to remember that these are metrics collected at the hypervisor level. And um, they've been collected and then they've been submitted to the, the, the CloudWatch, right? And, and then the CloudWatch is essentially a central repository where um, uh, it collects the metrics from different services and, and later and uh, you can use the CloudWatch infrastructure to get insights and visibility into what's going on with your system. Um, the next topic I want to cover is the third-party tools. And um, this is not exhaustive list. This is just, uh, I have what, five, six, five, six um, tools and five, six vendors that I've been told by my customers that they use to, to work with RDS. And a lot of the, and this list has been growing um, uh, uh, more and more because RDS is recognized as, as very important, very popular managed platform to run RDS, uh, to run SQL Server workloads. And these vendors, they um, essentially uh, adopt and, and start supporting RDS as, as a platform. And last but not least is enhanced monitoring. And um, uh, similar to that of the CloudWatch metrics, uh, there, is, there is also there's additional few metrics that you can configure and you can now configure to go and go a whole lot more granular you can configure them to be uh, uh, as low as one second uh, granularity. Very, very important feature to remember. Now, um, one thing to mention here, the enhanced monitoring metrics are, if CloudWatch metrics being collected at the hypervisor level, then the enhanced monitoring metrics uh, been collected by the agent sitting on the operating system. So important, that's important to remember. And that brings us to the end of my part. And um, here's some additional resources I've, I've collected about some of these things that I mentioned during the presentation. 
And now I would like to pass it over to Greg. And uh, as I mentioned before, Greg's organization just went through the large scale migration to RDS and Greg is going to share that experience with us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Eugene. Hello, my name is Greg Darby. I'm the Global Delivery Officer for the Daedalus Group, and I'm delighted to have the chance to talk to you today about our cloud migration experience with Amazon. Daedalus is the leading provider of healthcare and diagnostic solutions in Europe, and one of the largest globally, operating in many countries and across all care settings. Our aim is to support healthcare organizations today and in the future to give the highest standard of experience and functional capability. Our solutions are applicable within the walls of an organization or across a health community. And typically, these solutions are mission critical. We offer a wide range of solution delivery options, including a fully managed service. And here, I want to talk about the additional capability that we gain in partnership with AWS as we migrate solutions to hyperscale public cloud. Eugene has given us a really comprehensive view of the service options. So let me share with you a key program that we are running right now that uses Amazon RDS. At the time of submitting this status report, we had 13 electronic patient record systems running live on cloud. These systems service the administrative and clinical requirements of hospitals, mental health organizations, and other community-based care providers. We also have dedicated solutions for theaters, for medicines, medicines management, prescribing, all running on the same platform. And since that point, we've taken a further set of organizations live. We're gathering pace. The solutions run live service in a production setting, but cover live support, test, training, and other environments in use by our customer base. To give you some context about where this came from, the previous landscape was a data center solution. It was running from a dual data center configuration. It's 24 by 7 by 365 premium standard solution across um, multiple settings. It operates with zero downtime to support a fully paperless digitized operation across all of these settings. So we had a large multi-tenant approach. This involved 100 terabytes of storage across multiple instances. But this was leading to ever increasing backup windows, ever increasing extract times, and reporting having to run against the active database. The solution was fully resilient. It has failover within the data center, then disaster recovery failover to a secondary data center using a zero data loss solution. This was all self-architected and built and ran successfully for many years. So we start from a very high bar. We were approaching the time where we faced a technology refresh. So after careful review and consideration, we decided to plan a migration to cloud. We identified a number of target objectives that we wanted to achieve from the program, but we also need our customers to come with us on this journey and to give consent. The program had to address operational challenges like the backup windows. It needed to allow for bespoke patching cycles, but it also needed to give flexibility provision of production copies, additional training and test environments, rapid provisioning through automation. So Deadless provisioned a wide range of instance types and families. And some of the offerings from AWS are really neat. So burstable instances, for example, where typically the usage is con con consistently low, but occasionally peaks in an unexpected fashion. It gives us coverage. In the future, we also want to move away from some of the enterprise commercial engines, and we'll exploit further and capitalize on the use of read replicas. We decided to move to single customer instances rather than a shared instance. One of the reasons for this is that it allows us to give independence and tuning for those organizations, separating infrastructure and product. That allows us to really customize the offering. You may wonder why we do that and does it not increase the cost? And that's a good question. We consider this really carefully. There is a slight increase in costs for having these additional linked accounts because you're replicating the build estate as well as the customer workload. However, we think that on balance, that was the right thing to do. You could go further. You could separate payer accounts and increase the cost dramatically. We did not do that. So we have some shared infrastructure that supports the estate 
but then we have the full independence for the customers to give them the flexibility they need and expect. The other question that sometimes comes up around use of multi-tenant is, well, what about data sharing? We've chosen to go a route of interoperability and data sharing. In, in the past, we had the ability to share through the database level. Actually, we found that that was not something that our customers wanted to take advantage of. And so with our Daedalus Connecting for Health platform, we provide the same solution through a different technique. When we started to plan the work, we had a key configuration decision to make about the use of RDS or just using EC2 SQL. There are some very clear advantages for SQL RDS. We came from the background of operating a solution in a data center with a lot of experienced and very skilled staff. So we can operate SQL Server, tuning, optimization, backups. The advantage of SQL RDS is that it's easy to deploy, it's a managed service, it has a lot of automated features such as patching. The downside is that there are some restrictions about what you can do. So you have to think carefully, do those restrictions actually matter to you? If you go the other way with EC2, you have full flexibility, full control, full access rights, but you have the complex deployment. You have to manage that service. It's all there as your responsibility. We chose that even though we could do that, we felt it was better to go with AWS RDS as our solution. And working with AMS and our federated Active Directory and SQL Security, we're able to manage this across the estate far more easily than we were previously. The other key consideration in, in our environment is data migration. The core solutions that we migrate are actually providing full electronic patient record solutions. They include facilities that are necessary and needed in continuous operation with zero downtime. A paperless hospital without an elect electronic system cannot operate. So on this basis, the cutover is very disruptive and we have to minimize the outage. The core database in these solutions is typically a very complex SQL database, 31,000 stored procedures, 5,300 user tables. Our own tooling for data migration had worked exceptionally well for many years, and within the data center setting, it was absolutely perfect. However, it was not sufficiently performant for this activity. So we worked with AWS. We developed a hybrid solution, which combined our designs with the DMS tooling gave us that speed and gave us that performance. So the combination of the two allows us to extract data for a single organization from a shared instance. It allows us to move that data across and then to continuously replicate to keep data up to date. Another advantage of the cloud solution that we have is that you can do user acceptance testing against a replica of the live service database. So by simply taking a manual snapshot, we were able to give the authorized clinicians access to their own data to verify the cloud solution without any risk to the integrity of the data we were moving across. And as part of the process, we actually upgraded our SQL Server instances. We brought them to current versions so that they're actually fully supported. So one of the key things really uh, for, for the customer base is, so what are the benefits? Um, we, we did not look at this as a cost-less solution. We were looking to offer more for the same, um, same price point. So the kind of benefits that our customers were looking for really were around flexibility. It's, it's a tailored solution. It operates as a service. So what goes on behind the scenes um, matters less to the customer and more to us, but we have upgrade flexibility. We've been able to optimize performance, and I'll come back to that in the next slide. But we've also uplifted the platform. So we have an evergreen technology. I mentioned earlier on that this was a premium service and in the contracts that we had, the disaster recovery window was two hours, which is um, reasonably quick for a solution of this nature and size. But with the new solution, that flexibility that we have means that a full disaster recovery um, exercise takes less than two minutes. So two minutes to reinstate service in the event of a disaster. And again, for hospitals, where this is the heart of the uh, process, it's essential. We also have evergreen technology, so continuous adoption of the latest platform releases and patches, but without extended outages. Another feature in healthcare is there are certain periods in the year 
where there is heavy staff rotation, where new intake of staff takes place. With the um, cloud-based solution and the automation that we've created through this process, we're able to rapidly commission training environments, use them for this peak load, and then stand them down. So no ongoing cost throughout the year for the organizations. Security is always a concern, uh, ever-present concern in any industry and healthcare as much as anywhere else, if not more so. So here we're leveraging the expertise and the extensive investment from Amazon and ourselves. And we've created a, a digital fortress approach, a deny all approach, if you will, with continuous patching, continuous updating of that solution. But the cloud's more than just doing the same thing. So the cloud platform gives us the opportunity to, op opportunity to really transform the care model through the use of cloud native services, things like artificial intelligence, robotic process automation, internet of things, allowing us through our software defined data center to rapidly make changes to allow us to exploit technology as it, as it arrives to the clinician at the patient interface. One of the points I'd like to make about this program is really about the methodology. We have established a means of doing enterprise scale migration with a repeatable deployment approach. I talked about the numbers at the start of this uh, session and actually we're running at, at high volume doing two or three migrations per week. The reason we can do that is we're using blueprinted solutions that we've created with our AWS partners. We have a full service suite around data migration, interoperability, and uh, validation services. And we can apply that approach to cloud native services, to legacy technology, and we can incorporate on-premise or national infrastructure solutions through virtual private networks. All of this based around our AWS uh, solution. So just one final slide really to talk a little bit about the performance. Um, we took some measurements in the data center and again, restating this is a premium solution already in the data center. So we took some measurements and as far as we could, we did like for like comparison. Um, the data center statistics were collected shortly before migration and then we did the same monitoring again on AWS to compare. Only the pages used by the organization in question was measured, and we tried to do the same process on the same days at the same time. We considered time to serve, so the client processing time was not affected by this, this, this migration and therefore not included in the comparison. I think you can see that the results are quite compelling. Um, an overwhelming improvement in performance, 66%. Um, on the slowest 10 pages and 49% on the most common usage pages. Overall, consistent, consistent performance improvement. And at a time where time is precious and people expect to see continuous improvement, this is a real step forward for us. Most of the instances here are typically M5s. There are some T3s that where we've got lower utilization. But another key thing is the flexibility. So if we see a challenge and we want to improve the performance, we can very quickly change the type of server we're operating on. I would say in a matter of three hours rather than three months in a data center setting. And this flexibility can be crucial in a reconfiguration of a hospital organization. To date, this solution has been extremely reliable and extremely performant. It's improved access for clin clinicians, and it allows them to spend more time treating patients, quite simply. We've seen a momentum building and we look forward to continuing our Daedalus healthcare journey in partnership with AWS. Thank you.